And 3.3 is going to be a very quick um, section for us. Uh, there's just not a lot here. 3.3 deals with environmental issues in the transaction and mostly in residential transactions. It's not specifically a chapter um, that uh, is dedicated to residential real estate, but mostly in residential real estate. I saw uh, Titiana ask, will you have access to all this information after the course? Yes, absolutely. This is, I mean, you purchase the course. The course materials are yours. If you need to continue to use them and access them after the course is over, you will continue to have that access. I mean, obviously, um, you know, I, I don't think most people have a need to continue to access it after they pass the license exam, but definitely up until the point you pass the license exam. But if at any point you, you know, your um, access expires and you need to get back in there, just send us an email and let us know and we'll reset it for you. So no problem there. 3.3 um, is not very long. It's not very involved, but there are some items which I think will show up on the national section of the test. The good news for you all is that they will be very straightforward questions. These are not going to be questions of the with the gray area. You know, so many agency questions are gray area questions. It depends on the situation. It depends. Is this a client? Is this a customer? What's my relationship to this person? But these environmental questions that you see are going to be very straightforward. Here's something to put in context for you. Do you think? environmental issues, if we know about them or we should have known about them, should be disclosed in transactions as a material fact. How do y'all feel about that? Yes. 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 Definitely. Yes. yes. Yeah. One, one thing that I want to make sure to reiterate, because it's going to show up several times in test questions, is how and when we disclose things. We talked a lot about disclosure the other day. But always, on for test taking purposes, disclosures need to be made in writing. Okay, that's always how we do it. We may have a verbal conversation with somebody, and we may say, "Oh yes, there's a buried underground storage tank here." That's fine, but that does not satisfy the rule. The rule says that we have to make disclosures in what format? Right. 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 And writing. Now, don't make that writing. overly complex. Writing is any form of communication that's not verbal. Um, so written communication. Would a text message satisfy the rule saying you have to disclose something in writing? What do y'all think? Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, it's written. It's written. An email would work. Uh, heck, even... I don't know why you'd want to use something like, but Snapchat or, you know, Facebook Messenger, something like that. Obviously, I think we have a preference for email because there's a record of it. And it's nice to have a record of such things. The other thing to talk about when we make disclosures is the timing of the disclosures. Disclosures should be made in writing, yes, but when should they be made? And that answer, folks, is always going to be the same thing as well on the test when it comes to disclosing issues about the property or material facts or disclosing our compensation in the transaction. Pretty much anything we have to disclose about the transaction, we have to disclose in writing, and Mandy's got it nailed, before the buyer makes an offer before the buyer makes an offer. Because the idea here is whatever we're disclosing could change the buyer's offer. Could telling the buyer that there's an environmental hazard in this property change them even wanting to make an offer or if they still want to make an offer, change the offer number that they're willing to offer. Absolutely. Absolutely. For sure. Travis. Yes. What if, you know, you, ex you find as a um, real estate agent, you find something, some material facts after a buyer has made an offer and you disclose that information as soon as you found out about it. Is there any kind of window of time at that moment in time that the buyer 
now says, I don't want this anymore? Well, and that, first of all, it's a great question, Taj. I, I really appreciate the question. It's a fantastic question. So I'm, I'm just going to kind of restate it to make sure I've got your exact question in my brain and, um, and everybody else does as well. If for some reason there's a material fact that is not disclosed prior to the buyer making an offer. And we as a licensee become aware of it after they've made their offer. That's what you're asking, right? Correct. And, and you, then you then disclose it. And, and we just, and so let's be clear at that point, should we disclose it immediately? What do y'all think? If we, if we become aware of a material fact after the buyer's already made their offer, there's no like grace period at that point. It's like, boom, right then immediately we need to be disclosing. I think that's fairly straightforward. But then Taj asked the really great question in my opinion was, is there some period of time where the buyer can then back out? And the answer Taj is no, but let me explain why. Because the contract that the buyer signed is not with us. If we fail to disclose a material fact, we've made a mistake, right? And it, it, that could be an issue for us. We could be sued by that buyer, potentially. We could be disciplined by the real estate commission, for example, for something like that. But at the end of the day, the, the purchase agreement, the contract is not between the buyer and the real estate agent who screwed this up. The purchase agreement is between the buyer and the seller and the seller didn't screw it up. And so ultimately that's not going to be like a get out of jail free card for the buyer. They're still under contract. Um, and, uh, and so if the buyer suffers harm as a result of that, that's where you might see a buyer suing a real estate agent or um, filing a complaint with the real estate commission and saying, well, I lost my deposit on this house because I didn't know there was standing water in the crawl space and the agent should have disclosed it to me. And by the time I found out, it was too late to get my money back. Right. And so uh, Henley asked, could that be a negligent omission? Well, if we didn't disclose it, it's an omission. The, but we don't know if it's negligent or willful. We just, now I'm assuming if we found out after the fact, it would be negligent, right? That makes the most sense. If that's clearly we didn't know ahead of time and found out after the fact, we could be guilty of a negligent omission and they might sue us for that. Now, from a practical standpoint, Taj, because it is a really good question. From a practical standpoint, I'll tell you what we try to do is figure out a way to make it work for everybody in that situation. We generally try to find a way to make the buyer happy, you know, get some concession from the seller, try, try to make it work because obviously it's us who are in a really bad position there because we're the ones who have not done our job in that situation. But that's- Can they get out, can they get out during due diligence? Well, hold that question if you okay. will. I mean, because we want to talk about that due diligence contract a lot in detail, and that really does open up a can of worms. It's, <laughs> it's, important, it's important to remember that's a very specific contract. And so Taj sort of asked like a, a general question about contracts, and, and it's a different answer for certain types of contracts. So I want to make sure to give the general answer there. Okay. Now, if we know about material fact or, or uh, excuse me, environmental issues, they are a material fact. If we reasonably should have known, remember that whole reasonably should have known thing, we're going to be held responsible for like what they call red flags, obvious signs of issues. So as an example, we're going to mention and talk about, I'll uh, back up for, here for a second. We're going to talk about septic tanks in this chapter. You know, like it, it, there might be a problem with a septic tank. Well, here's the thing. 99 times out of 100, we as real estate agents would never be held responsible for failing to disclose an unknown material fact on a septic tank. I mean, for those of you that are familiar with septic tanks, where are they? Where's the septic They're in the tank? ground. <laughs> They're on the ground. <laughs> in the ground, which is almost the definition of hidden, right? You know, like, <laughs> And so if there is an issue with the septic tank, it's very unlikely that we're going to be aware of it or at least reasonably should have been aware of that problem because most of the time those things, 
don't become obvious until we dig the tank up, until we open the tank up. And that's just not reasonable for a real estate broker to, to, to do. But, but here's the thing now. We're in the middle of summer here. It's like 170 degrees every day. Hot. If you're showing a house out in, you know, let's just say you're going out in Nash County and you show a property and it's in a rural area and you know it has a septic tank and you're walking around the yard and the yard is sort of parched brown because it's been so hot and just, you know, so and it, it, all the grass is kind of parched brown, except there's this one super ultra green spot in the middle of the backyard and it happens to be really super mushy right there, like to the point that when you walk near it, it'll like the suction of the mud will take your shoes off. Is there an obvious sign that there's probably something going on with that septic system there? Yes. 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 Right? And that's the kind of thing that we have to be concerned about with material facts. It's not, it, it's not just that we absolutely know there's a, a problem with the septic system is, well, is there some obvious sign that we're overlooking? Does everybody see the difference there? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when it comes to federal laws that deal with um, environmental issues, it is important to understand, and this is a tough reality of owning real estate. The owner of a piece of real estate is most likely going to be held responsible for any cleanup costs associated with spills on their property, environmental contamination on their property. Here's the thing, and they call that strict liability. That's the, the terminology. You're liable. You're strictly liable for what happens on your property. But I don't think it really, really resonates through to people what that means. Does it say that property owners are responsible for spills that happened on their property while they own the property? Or does it say if it's your property, you're responsible? Which one does it say? On my own your property. It's your, your property, property. Your responsibility. If it's your property, it's your responsibility. It does not say only while you own the property. It doesn't say that there. We wish it said that there. Strict liability, folks. So let me ask you a question. Let's say that property has an oil drum, a 500 gallon oil drum buried in the ground, hasn't been used in 50 years. Now, I want y'all to think logically here. When that oil drum was abandoned 50 years ago, when they stopped using that diesel fuel to burn for heat, which is essentially what number two fuel oil is, is diesel fuel, right? When they stopped using that drum, do you think the homeowners went out there and had an environmental company pump all the remaining oil out of the tank and fill it up with some kind of sand or gravel and wash it out to make sure that, you know, there was never any chance that that oil leaked into the ground? You think they did all that 50 years ago? Heck no. Uh, no. They literally, let me tell you what they did. They literally went out there with an ax and the spout that was coming up out of the ground that was used to fill the tank, they chopped the spout off and they filled it in with dirt. And that tank's just been sitting there for the last 50 years. And it might have 50 gallons of diesel fuel in it. It might have 450 gallons of diesel fuel in it. And by the way, it's buried and it's made of steel is a steel tank, no matter how high the quality is, buried in the ground, eventually going to rust. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And when it rusts, are the contents of the tank going to escape out into the dirt around them? They will. Yes. Uh-huh. Could that oil that seeps into that dirt around that tank eventually make its way down into the, I don't know, like, an underground spring that feeds everybody's well water in the area. Mm -hmm. Yes. And when that, mm -hmm. when that happens and we have, and, and 20 properties in the area need new wells because of that contamination, who do you think is going to bear the cost of those 20 new wells in that area? 
any owner of that property. Yeah. The, the homeowner who's got the tank buried in the backyard. Meanwhile, they're not even 50 years old. They certainly weren't there 50 years ago when the tank was buried or abandoned. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. And that's what we mean when we talk about this liability. So what that means is it is really important for buyers to understand what they're buying. They need to verify that these environmental issues don't exist because they're taking on responsibility mm -hmm. for them when they purchase the property. Um, there is a, a cleanup fund called the super fund, but I will tell you there's generally not much financial help anymore. You, I mean, we've kind of migrated to a time where it's your property, it's your responsibility, you should have checked. Um, and so um, one thing to know though, once a, once a property has been designated as like a, a CERCLA uh, super fund cleanup site, that becomes a material fact forever about the property. You, once it's been designated as being an environmentally hazardous property, no matter what steps you take, and that's different than other material facts. That's why I like to point that out. What do we say about other material facts? If it's fixed, you don't have to do what? Disclose it. You, you don't have to disclose. But there, there is essentially no fixing an environmental issue. You may clean it up and you may remediate it. But even if you spent $150,000 taking that oil drum out of the ground and cleaning up all the soil around it, would you still have to tell buyers forever that there had been an environmental spill on that property? Yes. 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 These remain an an, uh, a material fact forever. Which is very contrary to our other definition of material facts. Right. It's very contrary to those things that are wrong with the structure, the, those things that are wrong with the property itself, because those things, once they're corrected, they're sort of off our list and off our radar. Um, one of the most common, in fact, probably the most common um, environmental hazard test question you'll see is having to do with lead-based paint. Now, this is not necessarily the most common environmental toxin or hazard that you'll deal with out in the real world, but it is probably the one that you're going to be asked about most commonly on the test, and that's why it's first in the chapter here. Lead-based paint is, uh, or lead itself, which is in lead-based paint, um, it, it, lead-based paint is simply paint that has lead in it. That's all that means. It's not a it's not anything fancy. It's simply paint that lead was used as an additive. And the lead was intentionally added. They did not realize at the point in time that they were using it as an additive in the paint that it, it, that it is harmful to your health. And for those of you of a certain age, you, you'll remember another very common substance that lead was intentionally added to because it had certain properties that were desirable. How many of you all remember the choice between Ooh. leaded or unleaded gas when you went to the gas station, right? That there, mm -hmm. were, yeah. that there were two options. You could either buy leaded gas or unleaded gas. And leaded gas was simply gas that had had lead added to it. Um, same way it could be added to paint. Um, what we found out over time is that um, lead is very highly toxic. It can be absorbed into the body in a number of ways. It can be absorbed through the skin. It can be absorbed um, uh, certainly by putting it in the mouth, um, anything that contains lead in the mouth. And so you would think, well, who would put paint in their mouth? I mean, nobody would put, I mean, so what if there's lead in the paint? Who would put paint in their mouth? Folks, is there one group of um, people that you can think about that might be in a home that have an issue with putting things in their mouth. Yes, babies. We oh, little children. Children. Mm -hmm. My especially. children. And my dogs. Well, I <laughs> dogs do it too, but, but kids especially here. And by the way, it is also toxic for animals. There are animals who develop lead-based poisoning from paint in the same way that people can from doing things like licking baseboards. And because if you think about, and the sad thing was this lead-based paint was not only used in the homes itself, it was often used on children's furniture because it was so durable. Cribs were notoriously painted with lead-based paint. We well, think about what a baby does with a crib. They stand on the edge of the crib all day long and they bite, they chew the railing, right? Y'all remember the old fashioned cribs with the wood drop rail on the side and it was painted probably white with lead-based paint. 
Um, you know, window sills, another place where children put their mouths all the time, very commonly painted with lead-based paint because it was very durable and shiny, it had a nice sheen to it. People, people liked it. Um, but it is a very, um, very toxic substance, especially for children. It causes all kinds of developmental issues in children in particular. It has been outlawed in, for, in residential property since 1978. That there has not been lead-based paint used in residential construction in the United States since 1978. Now, I will tell you, 78 is the year that we look at as sort of the magic year for test taking purposes. For practical purposes, generally speaking, it had largely been phased out long before this. Um, most homes built prior to like 1975 probably don't have any lead-based paint. But the year, the year when it was absolutely drop dead, you cannot use lead-based paint in residential construction is 1978. So if you are selling or showing a house built after 1978, do you need to worry about disclosing to buyers or tenants the potential of lead-based paint? What do y'all think? No. no. Yes. No. Oh, well, if it was built after 1978, they're no not supposed to use it. it, right? Because it was illegal. It could not be there. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. Yes. But if you are showing or selling a home, if you're leasing, this also applies to leases, a home, which would also include an apartment that you're leasing, right? A uh, duplex that you're leasing. If you are showing, selling, or leasing any sort of a residential property that was built prior to 1978, there are a couple of things we have to do, and you're going to be tested on them. Number one, warn the buyer, warn the tenant that this property is of an age that it might have lead in the paint. Now, this is where you're going to get in trouble on the test. This is going to be one of those things where the test questions aren't hard, but they're going to put nitpicky stuff in there. Okay. Did I say that we have to tell the buyer definitively whether there is lead in the house or is not lead in the house? Did I say that? No. 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 And that's going to be on the test as an answer choice, and it's the wrong answer. Does everybody hear me on that? We do not have to disclose to a buyer, we do not have to disclose to a tenant. Yes, Hilda, there's lead-based paint in this property. Even if it was built in 1942, when we know it probably has lead-based paint, we are under no obligation to disclose for 100% certain that there is or is not lead-based paint. Now, that would be different. If we know there's lead-based paint, do you think we would be obligated to disclose it? Yes. Yeah. Yes, because it's a material fact then. What we're saying here is we as listing agents, the sellers who are selling these properties, the landlords who are renting these properties don't have any obligation to know. We don't have any obligation to check. So if I'm listing a house built in 1942, do I need to have a paint investigator come in and scrape paint off of a baseboard to test to tell me whether or not there's lead-based paint in there before I can list the house? What do y'all think? No. 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 No, I don't need to do that. I, that is not required. And that's what they're, that's what they're going to want you to think on the test. I'm not required to check. I'm only required to disclose that there's lead-based paint if we know that there's lead-based paint. Is everybody with me on that? But I am required to warn the buyer, to warn the tenant. Now, notice the word I'm about to use because it's the most important word that there might be lead-based paint, that there could be lead-based paint, that it's possible that there's lead-based paint. And so basically what you're saying to the buyer is, we don't know, but it could be here. And if you would like to know, if that's important, then who should figure it out? You the think? buyer. The buyer should, or the tenant. If it's important to them, it becomes their responsibility. Once the real estate brokers have informed the buyer or tenant about the potential of lead-based paint, we've done our jobs. Does that make sense for everybody? 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, one last thing down here. Look at this. And this is federal law. This is not a North Carolina thing. This is federal law. This is anywhere in the country. If you are purchasing or renting a property that could have lead-based paint. So talk to me. What year was it constructed? Prior to 1978. Prior to 78. Before 1978. So it's older than 1978. Okay. If, if a buyer or is purchasing or a tenant is leasing a property that was constructed prior to 1978, and we warn them about the potential of lead-based paint, basically, if we say to the buyer, listen, we don't know if there's lead-based paint here or not, but there could be, we have to allow them to check. We, we cannot refuse the right for that buyer or tenant to check. It is their right to check, to evaluate the property. And notice what it says right there. They have how many days to do that? 10. 10. Here's why that's important. If they check and if they find lead-based paint during that 10-day period, what do you think the federal law says that they can do in that transaction? Back out. Back out. Back out. They can back out. They can back out. They can terminate that lease they just signed. They can cancel that purchase agreement they just signed. They do not have to move forward if they do this investigation and they find lead-based paint. Now, they could, if they wanted to, they could choose to move forward anyway, but it's up to them. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and folks, I would love to say, admittedly, this is becoming less and less of an issue because you know, over time, you get further and further from 1978. Um, but also over time, a lot of this has been treated. It's been taken care of. And there's actually two ways, and they're going to test you on these, that lead-based paint can be treated. It obviously can be removed. I mean, removal is always an option when you have an environmental hazard. The problem with removal is the expense. It is very expensive to remediate lead-based paint. As a matter of fact, let me go back to the picture I showed you earlier. This is what somebody has to wear when they're scraping paint that contains lead. Do you think it would be expensive to have to pay somebody to wear that outfit to scrape the paint off your house? <laughs> and, and by the way, you kind of can and cannot see it. Look what's on the ground here. What do you notice is on the ground where they're scraping the paint? Tarp. 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 Plastic, because that's what the federal law says, that as that lead-based paint is scraped off and removed, it can't hit the ground because the lead can absorb into the ground. So this is a very expensive process, the removal of lead-based paint, especially if we're talking inside the house. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. okay. So the most common way of dealing with lead-based paint is not actually to remove it. The most common way, how would you cover up, seal up, close up paint that you didn't want somebody to come into contact with? Paint over it. <laughs> paint over it. And there is a fancy word for that called encapsulation. If the lead-based paint hasn't cracked, if it's not peeling, if it's in good condition, it can simply be painted over. And that is an acceptable way of treating the lead-based paint. So here's what I would point out to you. It's now 2021. Lead-based paint is only possible in properties built prior to 1978. That's 43 years ago. How likely is it that you're going to find lead-based paint in these homes at this point in time that hasn't already been encapsulated several times since then? Because it's been what? And painted over. It's yeah. been painted over a bunch of times. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so this admittedly is becoming a little bit less of an issue for us. I will tell you where this does become an issue, though, just so you know, you probably won't see this on the test but renovations, because when you start ripping out and tearing out these walls, mm -hmm. all of that lead-based paint, think of all the dust that flies when you start tearing walls down. Well, at least some of that dust is what? Lead. 
is okay. lit and it can be easily inhaled and easily absorbed that way. So when you renovate those older properties, it is a problem because you're disturbing it. How we all feel about the lead-based paint? Pretty good on that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. Another, and this one will be much more common. This is a much more common actual issue in the real world now is radon. Radon gas. Radon gas, and, and, and I, I guess I should add gas here because it is a gas. It comes up from the ground. If you notice here, you see it, these red lines that they show here emanating up from the ground. Radon is a gas that comes up from the ground. It is a naturally occurring gas. It is around us at all times. It is not harmful unless it is highly concentrated. So even though radon is around us all the time when we're outside, it's not harmful because it's in very low concentrations because we're ventilated. You know, it dissipates very quickly into the atmosphere. The, the bigger issue is when radon is concentrated in a property and it can become concentrated in a property in a couple of ways. If you think about it, the foundation is sort of like a wall that keeps that radon gas in as it, you know, cause the radon is coming up from the ground underneath the home. And then you have this brick enclosure or you know, masonry enclosure and it traps all that gas that's, that's coming up from the ground. And so it kind of concentrates it. The other thing is if the property has well water, the radon can actually be dissolved in the water and make its way through the plumbing system. And think about that, all that nice steam cloud that you're showering in each day, um, at least some percentage of it is radon gas if you have well water. Um, and again, not harmful as long as it's not in high concentration. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. So what we need to know, and it is colorless, odorless, tasteless. There is no way to know. It's, uh, no, it doesn't smell like anything. Don't choose that on the test. It doesn't smell like oranges. It doesn't smell like farts. It doesn't smell like anything. It has no smell. It has no taste. It has no color. It is completely invisible gas. You do not know when it's around you. Okay. Um, it does cause lung cancer in high concentrations. And that number, that concentration level that you need to know for test taking purposes is four picocuries. You don't need to know what a picocurie is, thankfully, but four picocuries, it's actually a measure of radiation. Uh, it's named for Marie Curie um, because they, you know, the, 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 the Curies discovered modern radiation. Um, but um, it, it is a radioactive measure, um, but it is dangerous, considered to be dangerous when it's at levels above four picocuries. Just to give you some context here um, about how people should take radon seriously, um, it's pretty well established at this point in time that if you live in a house that has a radon level of six picocuries and for 20 years that you will have the equivalent lung cancer risk of a two pack a day lifetime smoker. Mm -hmm. um, that's a pretty high risk of lung cancer folks. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think that simply breathing the mm -hmm. air in that home could give you the same risk of developing lung cancer as smoking two packs a day for a full lifetime. Uh, that's scary. And the good news is it is easy to test for and it is easy to remediate. Look at this right here. What does it say we have to install in order to deal with radon? No ventilation. 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 It's literally just airflow. It's literally just airflow. And so when you look at this picture of this house over here on the right hand side, if it was determined that we had a radon problem here, here's exactly what we would do. We would come down here in the basement. We would drill a hole down into the ground right here. We would put a fan right there. And then we would ventilate and take a pipe up above the roof line to ventilate out up here. 
and that would be all it would take to, to it, it, I mean, it, it would cost thousand to $1,500 to remediate that problem. Is that a pretty small investment to take care of an issue that could cause that kind of health risk? Oh, yeah. I, yes. So one of the things I think you're always smart to recommend is that buyers do a radon test when they're purchasing the property. Number one, the test is cheap. Number mm-hmm. two, the treatment, even if we find a problem, is relatively cheap. So why not? Let's test for it, find out what we got. If there's a problem, then let's deal with it. Now, those of you that are not, you know, in central North Carolina or western North Carolina, if you're in the eastern part of the state, you won't have to worry about this nearly as much. Um, sand tends to be a very um, uh, unhospitable surface for radon. Um, and so when you get to the sandy areas of the state, you do not have nearly as much of the radon gas that comes up from the ground. I will tell you where almost every property will have radon gas. Do I have anybody from Western North Carolina, anybody from the mountains on the class? Right. If you're in the mountains, you got radon. Patty? Yes. If you're, if you're Patty's in the mountain, you got radon. There's just no way around. I live in Saluda. I live in Saluda and we're up on a mountain about 2,500 feet. Yep. Um, and right. so the more you're exposed to like bedrock, the more likely it is that radon gets. Because if you think about it, think about the soil in the mountains, it's not wet, it's not sticky, to get, it, it's cracked, right? And so those cracks allow that gas to much more efficiently escape. And so when you, um, when you, look at parts of the state it's definitely more of an issue in certain parts the good news is like i said test is cheap and it's easy to figure out if you have a radon issue and relatively cheap to remediate it if you have that thing if you see um a something that looks like a white suitcase on the side of the house with a pipe coming out of it that goes above the roof line that house has a radon remediation system on it. That's what that is. And that suitcase that you see on the side of the house is the fan unit. That's what it is. Now, yeah, if, you, if you see a oh, white looking well, suitcase thing that doesn't have a pipe that goes above the roof line, that's probably a tankless water heater. But if it has a pipe that comes out of it and goes above the roof line, it's probably a radon system. Travis, I have one on my house. And when um, I bought my townhouse, um, it was already in the home, but we still did a radon test just to make sure. But what, like my immediate neighbors, I'm in a townhouse, they don't have it, but I've seen them randomly in the neighborhood. So what keeps it, how is it only in one property, but not in like it's you know, very 10 properties random. down, but it's on the next street? Very random. It's very okay. random because it has to do with like how the underground cracks <laughs> and the bedrock are formed because okay. the radon follows those natural cracks and we don't really know where those natural cracks are and they move over time. So what you can do, you know, what happens sometimes is you'll test a home one year and there's no radon issue and you test it five years later and there is. So okay. it's also a test that people should repeat probably every couple of years. Folks, you can buy the test at Lowe's and Home Depot for like 15 bucks. They sell them right there in the store. Um, It costs you 15 bucks to test it yourself. And it's just a little charcoal canister. You go buy it. It comes in a little plastic bag, two charcoal canisters. It gives you directions. Open it up. Leave it open for two days. Seal it back up. It has an envelope in the thing. You mail it to the lab. Within a couple of weeks, you get a result. Cool. Mm -hmm. And so it's only like $75 for an additional professional one. Right. If you want like instant results from a professional who brings a, a, you know, like a real time meter to your house and drops Mm -hmm. it off, even that's only like 75 bucks. But if you just want, if you just want to know 15 bucks at Lowe's and you got yourself a radon test. So, I mean, it's, there's no reason if you don't know, go get one for yourself right now, you know, today, buy one this weekend and test, just see what you come up with as far as radon level goes. Extra credit. Just kidding. Just kidding. kidding. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Asbestos is a, um, so what what could you be asked about radon on a test? I guess I should clarify (laughs) that. It is colorless, odorless, tasteless. It causes what issue if it's in high concentrations? Lung cancer. Lung cancer. And that that 
action level or the level at which it is considered to be actionable is four pico curies. And the way you would treat it, the way you would deal with it is ventilation to ventilate the property. That, so those yeah, are the that things. That pico curies sticks out to me. Yeah. I think those are the things you could potentially be asked about radon. Um, asbestos is an issue in older homes, pretty much the same as lead-based paint. Um, as a matter of fact, asbestos was outlawed at the same time as lead-based paint, even though they don't really hammer you in uh, about the 1978 thing when it comes to asbestos. I don't know why they treat it differently. Um, but asbestos has um, the notorious um, reputation of causing lung cancer um, very quickly and uh, very devastatingly in people who inhale asbestos dust. Unfortunately, asbestos was used in a lot of products. Um, for example, people who worked as automobile mechanics um, in the 50s and 60s, almost all developed mesothelioma. How many of you have heard that on TV? You know, the, 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 the attorneys you know, saying, do you have mesothelioma? Call us at the hurt line and we'll get you paid. You know, mesothelioma is the type of lung cancer that comes from um, the inhalation of asbestos fibers. Why, why car mechanics? Because brake pads, brake linings were made of asbestos. And so if you've ever watched somebody change the brakes on a car, all that dust, now, and now they're ceramic and that dust is just ceramic dust, or at least we hope anyway, I'm sure 50 years from now, they'll find out there's something in that that will kill people too. But we, we know now that all that dust that you had when you changed brakes on a car in the 50s and 60s was asbestos dust. And of course, the mechanics inhaled it. But it was not just on things like cars. It was used in insulation in houses. It was used in the glue that held down um, floor tiles. Um, some of you will, uh, you know, that are of a certain age will remember like going to your elementary school and they had radiators for heat. And how many of you had like the, the old fashioned steam radiators in your elementary school? Remember that? Remember the puffy insulation that was around the pipes that went to those steam radiators? You know, that, that it was like hard and crinkly, but, you know, but, you know, we all sat there and like peeled it and messed with it all the time. That's asbestos. Um, all that insulation is, is made of asbestos. Um, asbestos, when it breaks down, when it starts to get old, when it's in good shape, it's fine. But as it starts to break down, the word is friable. That's a word you need to know for test taking purposes, friable. And no, I did not misspell that. It is F-R-I-A-B-L-E. F-R-Y-A-B-L-E is what French fries are. Um, F-R-I-A-B-L-E has to do with the breaking down of asbestos. It just means it gets fine enough that it can become airborne and become inhaled. Um, and so something that you had mentioned in a couple of classes before is the reason it was used is because it was so durable. It was fireproof, correct? It is fireproof. It has lots of insulating properties. It's very, it's very durable. It lasts a long time. So unfortunately, you will see asbestos quite a lot in houses um, because it has hung around for a long time. Anybody, uh, does anybody know where the single most likely place you are to find asbestos is in a residential property at this point in time? And by the way, it's also something that everybody who has it wants to get rid of it and, and rip it down and make a dust cloud out of it. Popcorn. <laughs> Popcorn ceilings. ceilings. The original popcorn in popcorn ceilings was asbestos. It was literally ground up asbestos that was put into paint and then sprayed onto the ceiling. Well, you can imagine what happens when you come in now and you start scraping those popcorn ceilings off. All of that dust, that is one big asbestos dust cloud. And so it, there, there is a tremendous risk there. And that's why you always have to warn people about buying houses and renovating them themselves because they may not be aware that these potential hazards. I'll, tell, so I'll, so I'll give you an example. Like our house was built right on the cutoff for asbestos. And um, when HGTV was coming in to plan the renovation, one of the things they did was they brought in somebody to scrape off a little tiny bit of the popcorn ceilings in a closet. They went in one of the closets in the corner and they scraped off 
the popcorn ceilings because that was part of what we wanted to have done to the house was get rid of the popcorn. But they had an environmental company come in and scrape it off and send it off to a lab to test it to make sure that there was no asbestos. And thankfully not. I did ask the question. I said, what if there's asbestos? They said, oh, well, we can still get rid of it. It just adds about $20,000 to the cost of the job oh, if God. there's asbestos in the, in the uh, popcorn. Why did HGTV remodel your house? Uh, love it or list it. Oh. You gotta film the video, yeah. Can we see that? Can we see, did you love it or did you list it? Um, I'm here. I'm still okay. here. So, okay, yeah, so yeah. You, loved, you loved it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but yes, our house was renovated for love it or list it. So, um, I think he knew that he wasn't going to list it from the beginning. Oh, like. for sure. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, there was no, it, it, there was a lot of acting going on. That's for sure. Um, but yeah, yeah, you can I, actually, I think, well, they replay it way too much anyway, but you can see it on like on demand anytime you want to. But um, I think they were replaying it on Labor Day. My mom keeps up with every time it's coming on. She's always like, oh, your show's coming on again on Labor Day. I'm like, okay, thanks, mom. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. <laughs> um, so yeah, it'll be there then. But just make sure you know that asbestos, when it becomes friable, it is a hazardous uh, substance like that. It is a material fact if we know about it or reasonably could have no known about it. Henley, you had a question about it? Yes. Is it is it only dangerous when it becomes friable? I saw a question. Some, I think that's what it was. Is it dangerous when it becomes friable or is it dangerous because it's asbestos? It is dangerous when it becomes friable. Asbestos that is in good condition poses no health hazard. Doesn't, okay. doesn't mean it wouldn't still be a material fact because obviously if it's there, it, at some point it will not be in good condition anymore. Um, and, and it will pose a health hazard. But as far as like an immediate health hazard, it's not an immediate health hazard unless it is friable, unless it is crumbling and breaking down. So a test question would be after it's friable, when it's not friable. That is correct. So here's an example of what we mean by that. Like the glue that holds down like kitchen tiles, like those old vinyl. Y'all remember a lot of kitchens in the 50s and 60s had that faux marble vinyl tile. Your grandma's kitchen all had it in there. You know, it was made to look like marble, but it was really that heavy vinyl stuff. Mm -hmm. well, it's glued down with asbestos glue. That's the reason that glue lasted so long because the glue had as ground up asbestos fibers in it. And it's not hazardous. The floor is not hazardous, but it becomes very hazardous if you start scraping that floor up because at that point you are disturbing it and it becomes friable. So that's when that would be a problem. And yes, Mary, it is a material fact if you're aware of it um, being present. Um, and and, and would be, just its presence would be a material fact because at some point it will become friable. It will become a problem. Um, same process for treating asbestos as lead-based paint. It can either be taken out, it can be removed, or it can be encapsulated. Now, in the case of lead-based paint, encapsulation means painting over it. In the case of asbestos, so let me give you an option here. You have that floor in this really old kitchen, the glued down faux vinyl tiles, and we know that the glue that's holding them down, and the floor is still in good shape, it's just ugly. We know that the glue that's holding them down is made of asbestos. There's two ways we can deal with that. We can remove the floor, and we, which means paying a company to come in and do the asbestos removal as well, or we can encapsulate it. How would you encapsulate it? Paint it? How about put the new floor on top of right. the old floor, right? Rather than rip up the old floor, you would simply put the new floor. And yes, are you going to have a little bit of an abnormal step up there? Yes. But you might save ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 in removal costs by not disturbing that asbestos. Because do, they, as long as do you then have to disclose it if you've remediated it? Um, you would just, no, you would not have to disclose it. Uh, okay. uh, you would just, you would just simply um, at that point in time have, have dealt with the issue, right? Okay. Okay. So it's much more cost effective to encapsulate things. 
Uh, mold, mold is a little bit of a tricky one when it comes to environmental hazard because mold is a natural substance. Mold is around us all the time. Um, and it is only a material fact if it is in abnormally um, large amounts or if it is of a type that we know to be harmful. In other words, the mold has been tested and it's like black mold. You can't look at the color of mold and say that's black mold. Black mold it has to be tested to know for sure there are other molds that look the same. Um, but if it has been tested and we know that it is of a harmful type, then it definitely is a material fact in any amount. It is only a material fact otherwise if it is in places where it should not be. Like, for example, in this picture, this is on the ceiling of a closet. This should not be there. Okay, so this would be a material fact, because in this case, is it really the mold we're concerned about here? Or are we concerned with the underlying moisture problem that is feeding the mold here? You know, and that's that's why yeah. mold in really high levels becomes a material fact. If it was just the mold we were concerned about, we'd spray it with Clorox and wipe it down, paint it and be done with it. But that the problem is that's not. The mold is just the tip of the iceberg. It's all the other water that's behind there causing that problem. Um, and I will tell you, nothing will make a property completely worthless faster than mold will. When this starts, if this is not aggressively taken care of, that can completely make the property to the point where it has to be torn down. Um, and it does not take long because it can grow explosively very quickly. Um, when it gets to this point right here, um, this was in the, um, the ceiling of a closet in the basement. And of course, above that is the floor going to the second floor. So this required removal of all the sheetrock in the basement, all of the insulation in the basement, all of the insulation on the first floor, all of the duct work and both HVAC systems because they've sucked this in and all those mold spores have started to grow within the condensers and all that stuff of the HVAC system, all the ducts. I mean, it just, because you're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to remediate major mold problems. Um, so that's why we have to be careful to make sure we're disclosing it if it is in, you know, areas where it should not be or, uh, and, and I, I've had people say, what do you mean an area where it should not be? I don't want mold anywhere. Folks, there's mold in your house. You got soap scum in your kitchen or in the bathroom. That's mold. That's a form of mold. Everybody's got some mold somewhere in their house. Um, you know, like, yeah, you may not think you, you may think you don't, but you do somewhere. I mean, I, I, I like yesterday I was gro completely grossed out. I went to refill the dog's w water and they have the automatic waterer thing, you know, with the, you know, it has the, the jug on the top. And meanwhile, I'm putting like filtered water in the things I'm putting filtered water in the jug and I'm screwing it back on. And, and I, I thought, well, I'm going to wash the basin out, you know, like I'm going to, because I don't normally do that. I normally just refill it. But when I turn that thing upside down in the sink, under the rim of it was just like mm. completely black with mold. And I'm like, so here I am giving them like filtered water in a freaking mold bowl, you know, like, and so there's always mold. It, anytime, anywhere there's water, there's going to be. I hate washing it because, well, with Dawn, because it's so hard to get the soap out of there. So I just use um, like Pine Glow or something that's antibacterial. Yeah. Because it's uh, really easy to rinse. Uh, Aloysia, there, there's, um, there are antibacterial wipes and sprays and antifungal wipes and sprays and there are companies who will come in in some cases if the mold has not progressed beyond a certain point um, the bigger challenge the bigger challenge with mold is always finding where the moisture comes from because wherever there's mold there's a moisture problem the mold does not grow without excessive moisture so you've got a much larger problem. The mold is just a symptom of the larger problem. We've got to find out where the water's coming from first and get it dried out. Um, and so it's definitely, now, a black mold, no. There is not something that will kill black mold. That has to be removed. If, if it has been tested as black mold, that has to be removed. Does black mold come from water? Yes, all of it grows from water intrusion, yes.
And so that's one of the, so one of the things home inspectors, good home inspectors will do when they go onto the house is they have a, a, a tester probe that they will poke into the floor joists in several different locations that reads the moisture content of the wood. Um, and you'd like to see something below 20%. Once you start getting above like 25%, if you get up into the 30%, 35% range, that is very much a danger zone for mold growth. Um, especially here in North Carolina, because you think about um, the heat and the humidity that we have, you know, and so you get this moisture problem, the heat, humidity is just a, is a, a recipe for mold growth. And in most people's crawl spaces, it never gets cold enough in the winter to actually kill it. So it continues to grow even during the winter um, because, it, you know, because it's not that cold here. Uh, to test for black mold, you have to bring in a, uh, there, you have to bring in a specialist to test for, there's no home black mold test kit. You'd have to call in a, a mold, uh, remediation company to test it to tell is you is that why there's plastic all underneath my house they did plastic all underneath my house when i bought it that's called a vapor barrier and that's okay. there to, and that's there to prevent moisture from coming up from the ground that's there gotcha. to, to keep so you know it's not unnatural for you to go there and you'll see condensation on the bottom of that and that means it's actually doing its job it's actually keeping that moisture from coming up into the crawl spaces keeping it down below the plastic so yeah that's, that's the purpose. Love the vapor barriers just because it's so much cleaner under there and don't yep. have to get dirty. Um, carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless, tasteless gas that at least we're not talking about something that you're going to be poisoned with over the course of 20 years because this is going to kill you in the first 15 minutes. That's the only good redeeming thing. It's not going to screw around with it. No, I'm kidding. I, I should not make light of that. But this is exceptionally dangerous stuff. Carbon monoxide gas is exceptionally dangerous because it does kill so quickly. Um, um, any home that has either a... Uh, a fuel burning source in the home. So that could be any gas appliance. It could be gas heat. It could be a fireplace. It could be a gas stove. It could be a gas water heater. Um, anything that burns that has a flame in the property, uh, you need a carbon monoxide detector in that property. Also, any home that has an attached garage needs to have a carbon monoxide detector in the property. Remember that one of the single biggest creators of carbon monoxide is your vehicle. Do not start your vehicle while it's in the garage, door open or not, don't do it. You have to remember folks, you have an HVAC system in that house and if that fan is running, it is sucking air into that HVAC system. If you have your car running in the garage, even with the garage door open, it is very likely that carbon monoxide is being sucked around your garage door and into the property. And it does not take much carbon monoxide in the air to incapacitate people, make them unconscious and eventually kill them. Uh, it will suffocate you. Um, so don't do it. Um, one of the biggest problems we have right now uh, that they're going to that the automobile industry is going to have to address and they're starting to is um, remote starts on vehicles people now are starting their car in the winter they go to the kitchen they make their coffee and they don't want the car to be cold so they start the car with the remote start while it's still in the garage and they're dying i mean they never make it to work because the carbon monoxide comes into the house and kills them um, and so it's definitely um, something to be concerned about. Also in North Carolina, of course, around during hurricane season, people have power outages and use portable generators and stuff like that. But um, make sure, you know, as far as test taking purposes go, in a leasing situation in North Carolina, this, this question is likely to be asked about North Carolina. In a leasing situation in North Carolina, the landlord is responsible for placing smoke and carbon monoxide detectors at the property. Notice it does not say the landlord is responsible for changing the batteries in them. That is the tenant's legal responsibility, but placing them, making sure there are functioning 
smoking carbon monoxide detectors in the property is a landlord responsibility in North Carolina. Okay. Meth labs. You can't have any fun anymore. You can't even make meth in the bathtub. So this is not a situation that I think sometimes people get confused because they said, I thought you said that criminal activity didn't have to be disclosed as a material fact, and it doesn't. We are not required to disclose that criminal. Remember, we talked about that the other day. We talked about stigmatized properties. We said somebody was killed in the property, somebody died in the property. None of that's a material fact. Does everybody remember that? Yes. So then why is a meth lab a material fact? Why is it if methamphetamine has been manufactured in the property, why is that a material fact? It has nothing to do with the illegality of manufacturing methamphetamines and everything to do with the fact that that is an environmental nightmare. Um, the manufacture, yeah, it, the manufacture of methamphetamine in the property contaminates pretty much everything about the property. I mean, it, the, it, if you've ever been into one of those homes that people have used for this purpose, they have to rip out all of the sheetrock, all of the flooring, all of the, I mean, it's pretty much bare studs that they have to go back down to, to get rid of the environmental contaminations. So this is a material fact as a environmental issue, if there ever was uh, the manufacture of methamphetamine in the property. And that's pretty much the only thing I think you'd be asked about that. Um, I mentioned earlier, those buried underground storage tanks, usually for fuel. They are a material fact um, if we are aware of their existence. Um, I would always recommend that buyers have the property checked. There are companies, there are inspectors who provide this service. They will come and check the whole property, the whole yard for buried underground tanks so that you know that there's not one there. Um, you know, if you're in an if you're in a pretty urban area and the homes are newer, there's very little likelihood of there being an underground tank. But if you're selling older homes, homes in rural areas, especially, there's a decent chance that there's a tank buried out there. And it could be a, a, it could be a fuel oil tank. It could be a propane tank. It could be uh, almost any kind of tank. And they put them in the ground because they're ugly and it was out of sight, out of mind. The problem is when you put them in the ground, eventually they leak. And, um, and so they need to be checked to, number one, we need to know if they're there. Number two, if they are there, we need to make sure that they've been dealt with appropriately, i.e. they've been cleaned out, pumped out, and filled with sand or gravel so that they don't collapse. That's the other problem. You let the tank sit there long enough, even if it's empty and it's not going to leak, eventually it will collapse because it will rust. And, you know, if somebody happens to be standing in that part of the yard, when it collapses, they disappear because they fall into the hole left by the tank um, and they can get really injured that way. So um, make sure that you are um, recommending to buyers that they check for these things. What if they have a small one, a small, I have a small tank for just the fireplace and the stove mm -hmm. and it's buried, but there's a big green manhole cover on top of it is that does that have to be checked and all of that no the nice thing about propane as long as you're still using the tank you are very aware that it's not leaking because if it was because it's highly pressurized the contents are highly pressurized so if there was a leak you would know about it because all your gas would leak out of your tank um the the big problem with tanks that have liquid in them is they're not under pressure so nobody's really aware and they're not being used so nobody's really aware if the stuff's leaking out of them. The nice thing about a propane tank is if you had a leak in your propane tank, a week later, you wouldn't have gas again. And you'd be like, what the heck's going on? I just put $200 worth of gas in here and we got no gas. And you would fix it because you would be aware of the leak. So propane tank's not nearly as much of an issue. Yeah. Septic tanks. Everybody's favorite topic in the whole class, I think, is septic tanks. Um, what I think why this is a funny topic to some extent is how some people have made it to this point in their life blissfully unaware of what a septic tank is and what its function is 
in the real world. So some of you, this will be a little bit of a sort of, I don't know, rude awakening, rude welcoming to the business because you've not, you've not dealt with this before or thought about this before. So here we go. Um, folks, when you flush the toilet, it's got to go somewhere. That's the best way I know to introduce this topic. Everything that goes down the drain lines in your house has to go somewhere. And that's going to include water from obviously the sinks and from your, your dishwasher and your washing machine. But it's also going to include solid waste that comes from the toilet. It's also going to include the food that goes down a garbage disposal, you know, and th everything that goes down a drain goes somewhere. If the property is located in a city, there is a high likelihood that the somewhere is a city sewer system, that you are connected to the city's public sanitary sewer system. Here's what I always ask people. Do you have a bill? Do you get a bill every month for water and sewer? Can I see the bill? That's the easiest way to determine if they're on a sewer system or not. Because if they're on a sewer system, they will have a bill for it every month. As a matter of fact, for my house in Cary, the sewer portion of the bill is much more expensive than the actual water portion. You know, we have a set, we, it's two, broken out into two separate pieces all on the same bill, but the water portion is always the smaller part of the bill. And then the sewage treatment portion is the larger part, right? And so you've got a, yeah, uh, you got a sewer system, you don't have any concerns as, as far as a real estate agent in that transaction. But if the property is located in a more rural area, and some properties in cities also fall into this because they might have been built before there was a sewer system. So older properties in cities could still be on septic tanks. But if you're in a rural area, if they don't have a sewer bill, if you ask them for the bill and they don't have one and they look at you like you're crazy, they have a septic tank, folks. A septic tank is a, is a on-site private sewage disposal system. So you have your own sewer system on your property. Except system is a very glorified word for it because what you have is a tank buried in the ground. The problem with when I say tank is that most people who don't know the function of these things have the wrong perception in their mind. We think of a tank as something that is meant to be sealed up, right? Folks, septic tanks have holes the size of your thumb in them. Hundreds of holes the size of your thumb in the I have to go stick my thumb in one. You can go for it. They are made for the water to get out of them. Otherwise, they would fill up very rapidly and you would not be able to flush your toilets. You would not be able to run any more water down the drain. The tank is made to do one very important function separate the solids from the liquids. The, the purpose of the tank is so when the stuff comes in, the heavy stuff falls to the bottom, the water comes to the top, and the water leaves the tank. So what's left in the tank, folks, for those of you keeping score? The we waste. do want to say and now, it's too early to talk about. <laughs> solid stuff, just the solid stuff, okay? Um, and folks say, well, where does the water go? into your yard. That's where it goes. Every bit of water that you're flushing down your toilet, every bit of water that's dumping out of your washing machine is going into your yard. Think about that before you start dumping things into the toilet because you may as well go out and dump it on the backyard because that's what you're doing. If you wouldn't pour it on your backyard, don't pour it in your toilet if you have a septic system because that's exactly where it's going, okay? Um, and so it, it, the, the idea here is to separate the solids from the, wa from the water. The water comes out into a drain field. Patty's exactly right. There are pipes that lead out from the tank that also have holes in them that are designed to take the water out and disperse it and spread it out into the yard. And that's, that is an on-site septic disposal system. Um, you know, This is not the most glamorous part of our job. 
I, that's all I'll say. But it is part of the job. Because if people are buying a property, they need to know what kind of uh, disposal system they have. And FYI, um, they need to be inspected. If you're doing a home inspection, that does not cover inspecting the septic tank. That's a separate thing. Uh, Travis, I'm from the city. Uh, where, um, what do we do with the, um, <clears throat> the solid waste? That sits there. It stays in the tank until it's until the tank needs to be pumped. I'm from the city. <laughs> you got a nice visual going on now. <laughs> uh -huh. Actually, the hope is that the the tank does not ever need to be pumped. Really, even though they almost always do. If you have a healthy septic tank and you have enough bacteria going on down there, the bacteria will eat up all the solid waste and it will disappear over time. Um, that's why you should, folks, th this is really good advice, actually. If you have a septic tank, don't use a lot of bleach in your washing machine. Don't put things like um, Clorox down your toilet because that bleach kills the bacteria in your septic tank and you need those bacteria alive and hungry down there. Um, you need them eating and don't, eat, don't kill them with bleach um, because you will have to pump the tank out much more regularly. It will fill mm -hmm. up much more regularly if you kill the bacteria in it. That's why when you go, how many of you have ever seen um, at like Lowe's or Home Depot, you see like RIDX is a program called, uh, 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 it's literally just bacteria in a can that you dump into the toilet and flush into your septic system. It's, it's there to, it's like Activia for your belly, but for your, but, but for your septic tank. Probiotics for your septic tank. It's, it's probiotics. That's exactly what it is. It's bacteria that you're dumping into the septic tank. It's, it's the Activia of septic tanks. That's what it is. And, uh, um, the inspections of them are fun. When somebody's buying one of these houses, we have to inspect the tank. Well, you can't inspect the tank without pumping it out, folks. So get ready while you're there during the home inspection to have somebody out in the backyard, dig up the cover of the tank, uncover it, climb down into it, and pump it out. And pump it louder. That, that does not smell good at all. And you'll be there. And the fun part is always, always, it never fails, that the person who runs the pumping truck, the person who's doing the pumping, is always eating a ham sandwich while they're doing it. <laughs> I don't know why that is. I don't know if they just show it off just to make us oh be more God. grossed out. But they're always standing down there in the tank, pumping it out, oh. eating their lunch, leaning on the side of the tank. I don't know why they do that. But yeah, get used to it. <laughs> oh. um, and it smells exactly as good as you would think it would. The other thing I'll tell you, if, if you want to see how crazy people are, go into residential property management and manage properties that have a septic tank because you would be amazed what people will flush down a toilet. Mm -hmm. Folks, it's going to get found again. Because if you keep flushing that stuff down there, the tank's going to fill up and somebody's got to pump the tank out. And those septic tank pumpers love to bring you a prize. Like, well, here's your problem right here. If the prize is made to like be an adult novelty toy, don't flush it down the toilet. That's not where that goes. Oh my God. You're not really disposing of it. Somebody's going to find it again and it's going to be your landlord. And that's not a fun conversation. Why did you flush that? I don't know. I had, I had one tenant who flushed like eight of them. We found like eight of them in the septic tank. I don't know. I don't know. Weirdos. I don't know. I don't want to know. But I did have to ask her not to do it again. Oh, God. Please don't put these down the toilet. This is not <laughs> um, embarrassing. So, and, 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 and that part will be tested. No, I'm kidding. That part won't be tested. But what will be tested about septic tanks, what will be tested about them is how we market a home that has a septic tank. And this is a big deal. Septic tanks are rated for a number of bedrooms. 
um, that the rating for septic tanks is not based on a number of people or number of square feet. It is based on a number of bedrooms. So it is uh, a septic system will be rated as a three bedroom or a four bedroom septic system, as an example. Everybody, does everybody understand what I mean? Like mm -hmm. they don't they don't say this septic system is good for ten people. They say it's good for four bedrooms. That's that's the way they rate the systems. In North Carolina, we have a law that says real estate brokers can only legally market the property at a maximum number of bedrooms that matches the septic permit. Here's what that means. If you're selling a house on Lake Gaston that has a septic tank and there are 12 bedrooms in the house, it's 9,000 square feet with 12 bedrooms and you go pull the septic permit and it says this is a four bedroom septic system, what do you put in the MLS for number of bedrooms for that property? Four. 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 It, does, it does not matter how many rooms there are in there that have beds in them and closets and windows. It, when you are marketing a property that has a septic system, you have to market it as the number of bedrooms per the septic permit. Everybody not how many the owner has like made into a bedroom. Well, that's exactly the right. Office. Yep, that's exactly right. It, it's a it, it's the number that shows up on the septic permit. We all good with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that means basically, if you're marketing a property that has a septic system, you got to go pull the permit um, from the county to see what that permit says. And that's it, folks, for section 3.3. That takes care of everything about environmental issues.